Phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
Today is Monday, March 4, 2024. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Unanimous decision from the Supreme Court ruling that states should not have the authority to determine whether presidential candidates are eligible to run for office. Hmm. The nation justice correspondent Ellie Mister will join us to talk about how the justices went further than what the case was actually all about. You also can't believe everything you see on the internet. Conservatives are creating AI-generated content aimed at black voters, showing how they just love Donald Trump. It's all a lie. Plus, NFL Hall of Famer, Pro Football Hall of Famer Emmitt Smith blasted his college alma mater, the University of Florida, after the school uh, gutted its entire DEI department. Guess what? It's time for black athletes to say, we're not going to schools that don't support DEI. Also, we're talking to the candidates running for uh, the 18th Congressional District in Houston. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee is being challenged by Amanda Edwards. We'll have both of them joining us tonight. Vice President Kamala Harris was in Selma on Sunday commemorating the 59th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. We'll show you some of what she said. Plus, in our Fit Live Win segment, we are looking at the disparities in diagnosing black people with Alzheimer's. And Dalton, Illinois City Council meeting tonight. We'll see if the council gets some answers from Mayor Tiffany Hinyard on a host of issues. We'll dip into that council meeting live. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Side Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. A unanimous decision. The Supreme Court uh, says states cannot kick Donald Trump off the ballot over his actions leading up to the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. In the unanimous unsigned ruling with no dissents, well, not really, the court reversed the Colorado Supreme Court's decision, which had determined that Trump could not serve again as president under Section 3 of the Constitution's 14th Amendment. That provision prohibits those previously held uh, government positions, but later engage in insurrection from running for various offices. Joining me now is the justice correspondent for the nation, Ellie Mistel. Ellie, glad to ha have you here. So, just like the Dobbs decision, the conservative majority actually went further than really what was on the table, correct? Yeah, once again, the only amendment this, that this Supreme Court cares about is the Second Amendment, and they treat all the other amendments like mere suggestions that they can ignore whenever any other constitutional rule threatens to hurt their daddy, Donald Trump. And so they determined that the only way someone can be held accountable with the Insurrection Act if Congress passes a law. That's not in the Constitution. I thought these were strict constructionist originalists. Yeah, we hope Congress may be able to pass a law, right? Look, what was on the table was whether or not the Colorado State Supreme Court could, on its own authority, exclude Donald Trump from the ballot because of his apparent and legally uh, agreed to violation of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which bars insurrectionists from running for office again. The Supreme Court unanimously said, no, Colorado does not have that authority on its own accord. I disagree with that, but that's that's the way that cookie crumbled. And it was obvious that that part of the decision was going to be 9-0, even if you just listened to the oral arguments from the Supreme Court. So then the second question is, if not Colorado, then who, right? Who can use this section of the 14th Amendment if not the state of Colorado, right? That is a question that the Supreme Court 
didn't have to answer, right? Nobody asked them, but they decided on their own accord to answer that question, and then they answered it poorly. So instead of saying that, for instance, a court of law could apply the 14th Amendment. So imagine in this kind of bizarro world where Merrick Garland actually does something. Imagine that Merrick Garland had prosecuted Trump for insurrection and he'd been found guilty of a treason or sedition clause, right? That should normally attach, make the 14th Amendment operate, right? That's how it would work for any other amendment. But the court said, no, no, no. Even in that case, even in the case where Trump was tried, convicted, and jailed for insurrection, that wouldn't kick him off the ballot. The only thing right. that can kick him off the ballot, according to the conservatives on the Supreme Court, is if Congress, by law, passes a piece of legislation specifying that people who are charged with insurrection are kicked off the ballot. So that part of the decision, that part was not unanimous. That part was actually 5-4 kind of boys versus girls. It was the five male conservative justices saying that, yes, only Congress could do this, and the four women, including Amy Coney Barrett, kind of, saying that that's a, that was a bad ruling, that the court went further than it was than it needed to in order to protect um, and, to, and in order to protect their lord and savior, Donald Trump. And here's why that's total BS. <laughs> in Arizona, there was an elected official who a judge rule engaged in the insurrection on January 6th, and he was barred from running for office in that state. And that, that's exactly right, Roland, but that, but think about, like, take that to its logical conclusion. Who is the, trims, the Supreme Court trying to help? And you see that the Supreme Court isn't just trying to help Donald Trump, it's trying to help everybody who attacked the Capitol on January 6th. It's trying to help Marjorie Taylor Greene. It's trying to help Jim Jordan. It's trying to help whatever local oath breaker, oath boy, proud boy, whatever white supremacist you want to call it. It's trying to help all of those white supremacists not lose any ability to run for office and continue their coup. That's, where, that's the extreme part of the Supreme Court's ruling. They could have kind of cabled it just to Donald Trump, but no, 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 the five conservative men said we're trying to make the world safe, make government safe for all of the rest of the white supremacist insurrectionists should they wish to run for office in the future. That, that's the real upshot of, the, of today's ruling. Here's also why the ruling is utter BS. Let's say Donald Trump was in his third year in the Oval Office and engaged in an insurrection. The Supreme Court is saying that Congress has to pass a law. Um, the only way the law becomes effective is if the president signs it. So what they're saying is that the person who engages in the insurrection uh, could actually just veto the bill, and then it will require two-thirds of Congress to override the veto. That's nuts that Congress gets to pass a bill that the president would have to sign to hold him accountable, and he could run again. Do you see how the fix is in? I mean, like, you're exactly right. So, like, what do we take from that information? And what I take from that information is that the fix is in, and the Supreme Court is 100 percent in the tank for not just Donald Trump, not just Donald Trump personally, but his entire white supremacist movement. Like, that is what they are trying to make the world safe for. And it's not just with this ruling about the Colorado um, court today. Remember, part of what the ruling does is that it uh, counteracts all the other states. There are 30 states right now considering kicking Trump off the ballot. This ruling takes all of those states out of the out of the conversation, right? Even in, like, Maine, where they have uh, not a court, but the state attorney general applying the Constitution and Maine's laws. That case is not out, is now out, right? So it's not just Colorado, it's what they've done to the entire ballot access question, but it's also what they've done last week, right? Where we saw the Supreme Court decide to hear Trump's ridiculous, legally fallacious and stupid immunity argument 
on April 22nd, there, thereby making it almost impossible for us to bring Trump to trial before the election. So when you start to link up everything the Supreme Court is doing, when you start to take this decision and that decision and, oh, look over there what they're doing, what you have is an entire kind of effort to make the world safe for a Donald Trump um, re-reformation, for a Donald Trump um, reappointment as the as the commander in chief. And that's what the Supreme Court wants, and that's what they're trying to do. Looks like Fox News right winger Will Kane isn't too happy with you. He tweeted this earlier where he said, Enough with this saving democracy junk. There isn't an institution, our constitutional republic, the there isn't an institutional institution in our constitutional republic they won't destroy for power because you had tweeted anyway, as I said last week, the Supreme Court uh, must be stopped. Uh, and so, uh, again, not, hap uh, not happy uh, with that. He also had tweeted this here, which I thought was uh, utterly hilarious. Uh, let me pull it up. Uh, he goes, um, here it is. Let's review what must be destroyed to save democracy. Voting, free speech, Constitution, Supreme Court, Electoral College, RFK, no labels, Dean Phillips, rule of law, rural white voters, Southern border, separation of powers, privacy, domestic surveillance limitations. What else? Well, I say Fox News. I mean, look, Will, Will Kane always looks dumb whenever somebody forces him to act without reading Skip Bayless's crib notes. And, right? he's, a, and he's a like, so, he's a so-called lawyer. Like all, all Will Kane can do is read what Skip Bayless tells him to do and kind of make make statements based on that, right? So he's clearly an idiot. But he didn't read my article, right? Because if you read my article. What I said in that article about the Supreme Court needing to be stopped is that we, the people, need to take every shred of power that the Supreme Court still allows us to have, which is not that much, every shred of power that the Supreme Court allows us to have to stop them from remaking the law in Trump's and the white supremacist image, right? And that means that we have to do things like cut their budget, right? that we have to do things like cut their power, perhaps using uh, the, the idea of jurisdiction stripping, which is, you know, a legally scholarly lawful idea that says that the Supreme Court is not the final arbiter on what is or is not in the Constitution. People forget there is nothing in the Constitution that says that the Supreme Court gets to make laws unconstitutional. That power was invented by, wait for it, the Supreme Court itself in 1803 in a case called Marbury v. Madison, where it called onto itself the power to declare laws unconstitutional. That wasn't in the con un that wasn't in the original Constitution. That wasn't what James Madison and Alexander Hamilton imagined when they wrote that thing. So this idea that the Supreme Court that our Supreme Court should have so much power is different than a every other country on the on the planet, but also different than what the Constitution itself calls for. The Constitution says the Supreme Court should exist. It does not say the Supreme Court has the final say on what's in the Constitution. And what I'm advocating for is for people to wake up and realize that and stop letting these nine unelected, unaccountable rulers lord over all of, the, all of us with their fake power. But let's also keep in mind that you have a Supreme Court that decides whether it should recuse itself from any case, and you have a Clarence Thomas whose wife was very much involved in trying to overthrow the election result, sitting in judgment and not recusing himself. But in an earlier case, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, I think it was the Harvard admissions case, chose to recuse herself. A perfect example how liberals want to play by a set of so-called rules where conservatives go, damn the rules, we got ultimate power. Right? No, the, I, I always say that liberals think they're playing chess, right? And they 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 kind of have all the pieces and they're like rook to e7, and that's right. And Republicans take the chessboard, fold it in half, and start bashing liberals on top of the head and be like, "I won the game, yo!" And liberals are like, "No, that's 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 not in the rules. You, your king was knocked over. You've technically lost." Republicans don't care. Republicans are winning through force. And as long as the liberals keep seeding the ground and backing up and seeding the ground and waiting for a rule book to fall out of the sky to protect us, we will continue to lose. The Supreme Court has a budget that is set by Congress. It can be cut. 
The Supreme Court has a power that's limited by the Constitution. It can be cut. And until we start doing these things, these Supreme Court justices will keep wafting around the country as if they own the place. Last point here. Uh, this tweet went out, and I think it uh, is appropriate. This person said, nobody has ever been more right about anything in the history of America than Hillary was right about the importance of the Supreme Court in 2016. And there were so many Democrats, so many progressives, who chose to sit on their ass, stay at home, because they were pissed off at her, saying that they didn't like her, and, and they didn't like this, and she, she, she mentioned predators, uh, and, uh, oh, uh, she was this, that, and the other, and she didn't go hard enough against her husband, and all this sort of stuff like this. And what ends up happening? Conservatives get three Supreme Court justices. They block 100 federal judgeships uh, from uh, Barack Obama. And what do we get? Affirmative action decision, this decision, new Roe v. Wade being overturned, and all because, let's be clear, there were some people, black, white, Latino, Asian American, men, women, gay, straight, who were like, I just don't, Hillary, I just don't get it. And Republicans were like, we got no problem electing the thug because he's going to do what we want him to do. Look, there are three branches of government, and I keep trying yep. to get people to realize that is, it is the third branch, the Supreme Court branch, that has a veto power over the other two branches. Yep. So if there is anything you care about, whether it's gun safety, whether it's environmental regulations, whether it's police brutality, whether it's financial regulations, whether it's uh, issues about uh, access to justice. Whether, 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 it, whether it's billions to black farmers, whether you actually say you support reparations, guess what? That's going to go to the Supreme Court. All of it ends up on John Roberts's desk. And as long as John Roberts has five other conservative votes, John Roberts and the other conservatives will continue to do whatever they want. It doesn't matter about your arguments. It doesn't matter about your votes. It's six votes that matter, not the votes of 330 million, million Americans, right? And so if you don't use, again, what little power you have, what little power they allow you to have to deploy your votes for the party that is going to try, one hopes, to stop them, that is going to try, one hopes, to rein in their power, then all you are doing is ceding the ground not to whoever the Republicans elect, but to these six unelected judges to do, again, Roland, whatever they want. Ellie Mistel, Justice Correspondent for The Nation. Uh, Ellie, we appreciate it. You're not going to see him for a bit, folks. He's working on a book, so he needs to get that done. But Ellie, I'm glad you took some time talking to us. Always, Roland, and congratulations to you. You're the best. I appreciate it, sir. Thanks a lot. Got to go to break. We come back. We'll chat with my panel about this. I keep telling y'all, all y'all people who keep telling me, and eh, you keep bringing up those judges. Hashtag, we tried to tell you. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. You heard why we're marching, and, and it's really a launch. It's not even a march. We're launching That's right. a 42-week campaign march the 2nd at 10 o'clock in Raleigh and 33 other state capitals right. and the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a historic move to mobilize mm -hmm. the most powerful untapped block of voters in this country, That's right. poor and low wealth voters, mm -hmm. who make up 87 million votes. And it's never been tried before. Never been tried before in history. At the same time, the same message, same focus. And when that power turns loose, yes. they will not be able to figure out the political calculus. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to shake things up. I'm ready to get up out of the valley. I'm ready for God to put his spirit on us. I'm ready to be used to change this nation. And what we're saying is, can't we come together? Can't we come together around an agenda? You ain't got to like everything about Reverend Barber. You don't have to like everything about St. Greer. You don't have to like everything about Long Choir. But can we come together and say, it's time to end poverty as the fourth leading cause of death? It's time to have $15 and 
at a living wage indexed with inflation. So every time inflation goes up, the minimum wage goes up. It's time to have health care for all. It's time to fully fund public education. Can't we come together? It's time to protect women's right to women's health. It's time, it's time to have affordable housing for everybody. It's time to stop the proliferation of guns. Ain't no way folk ought to be able to have more guns than they have food, more guns than they have meat on their table. That makes no sense. Isn't it time for division to be ended and love to take over? Can't we organize around that? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't need to like everything about you. But can't we organize for power? Can't we stand for justice? Can't we love everybody for just a little while? Can't we come out? I'm Paula J. Parker, Judy Proud on The Proud Family, Louder and Prouder on Disney Plus. And you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, uh, let's go to my panel. Uh, joining me right now is Dr. Julian Malvo, economist, president, emeritus, been in college, author out of D.C., Dr. Amakongo Dabinga, senior professorial lecturer, School of International Service with American University, also out of D.C., Rena Shannon, former Georgia State Representative out of Atlanta. Glad to have all three uh, of you here. Uh, Renita, I I'll start with you. Uh, I I'm going to keep pounding this over and over and over. And I've got some simpletons out there who keep telling me, again, I, I love the, the nonsense. All oh, right, man, you a shield for the Democrat. You keep trying to make us vote for Democrats. Take party out. Focus on issues. Money for black farmers. Affirmative action decision. Civil rights. Voting rights. Section 4, Shelby V. Holder. Section 2. Uh, e uh, environmental rights, environmental racism. Federal judge down in Louisiana ruling against Cancer Alley. A circuit out of Arkansas saying third party groups don't have standing when it comes to filing voting rights lawsuits. Federal judge in Louisiana tells the state, get those juveniles out of Angola prison. Federal judge in the panhandle in Amarillo rules against the Plan B abortion bill. I can go on and on and on and mention numerous laws that are local, state, and national that the federal bench rules against. And so for any fool who tells me at the 150 plus judges that Biden and Harris have appointed a significant number are African American, a significant number are black women, do not matter, they have got to be stupid. This ruling today is something that is really at odds with what conservatives have been fighting for, because for the last several years or so, they really have been fighting about how states' rights are really important in various different areas, and one of them has been in controlling elections. And so we've seen fights here where conservatives have been making the point that the federal government should not be making decisions on what happens in elections, and that is a job at the uh, state level of the secretary of state. So this ruling today is very interesting, where you mentioned before that, you know, they went a little further than they should have gone. Um, the Supreme Court went further on the Dobbs decision. And once again, now they've gone further than what they were originally asked, except this time it's going to be at odds with what conservatives want. Now, what I think is very interesting is what Ellie talked about, which many of us know and have felt at a visceral level, which is the analogy that he said about the chessboard, where Democrats are 
um, thinking that they are playing chess and Republicans really don't care about the rules of the game and they are just willing to take the chessboard and beat the Democrats over the head. We have got to get tougher. My question is, does the, does the Biden administration understand how important the Supreme Court is? Because many people were asking the Biden administration, President Biden, directly to expand the court when he had when we had full power in the first two years. And that was something along with breaking the filibuster to pass his agenda that he decided he did not want to do. So at the end of the day, the Supreme Court should not have as much power as it is wielding, and it does not have to have as much power as it is wielding if we codify into law the rights that we want to have. The Supreme Court's job is to, once legislation has been passed, they are supposed to then make decisions around interpreting legislation, not actually be passing legislation. And as Ellie said before, the Supreme Court should not have any power to just say that something is unconstitutional. And so at the end of the day, this really is a problem that we really need to stop relying on the courts for our rights and actually pass the legislation that we want to protect our rights so the Supreme Court does not have the power that it's currently yielding. But on Congo, if it's set up the way it is right now, what I am saying to Democrats, progressives, independents, black people, okay, if you use the power of your ballot, then you're in control. Here's the reality. Manchin doesn't run for re-election in West Virginia, which means Democrats can't lose Sherrod Brown's seat in Ohio. They can't lose Rosen's seat uh, in Nevada. They can't lose uh, uh, Cinema's seat. You got, guards, you got uh, uh, the Democrat who's running against, running against, she's independent, he's running for that particular seat as well, or Tester in Montana. So you got to hold the line in the Senate, and you got to win the White House. Here's the deal. Alito and Th Thomas are in their 70s. Yep. And when I've said this here, Roberts, I think, is 66 or 67. So, understand, if you do the math, if Democrats win the White House and hold the Senate in 2024, win the White House and hold the Senate in 2028, it is likely they're going to pick two or three of those positions. Which means, again, if your focus is on winning... If you win in 24 and you focus on 28 and you win in 32, by 2033, it's a good bet they're going to be able to control the Supreme Court. All is not lost. But if Democrats don't win in 2024, mm -hmm. you're going to see Alito and Thomas likely pull an Anthony Kennedy. And that is Republican president, Republican Senate, they retire, pick their replacements, likely in their 40s, to guarantee they're going to have a five-seat majority for the next 30, 40 years. It's, called, it's simply called math. And I would add to what you're saying, going off of Renita's point, they'll also expand the courts. I can clearly see a situation where Trump will try to stack the courts even more to get more justices on there to, to keep their rule. Look, the great civil rights organizer of the March in Washington, Bayard Rustin, said, Bayard Rustin said, I saw in an interview in like the early 80s or something, he said, we protested because we didn't have the vote. And he said, but when you have the vote, you don't need to protest. And that, that floored me for such a great organizer that, that he was. And basically, we need to be mindful of that. We can get out there and be mad and cry at every Supreme Court decision, whether it's Dobbs and so on and so forth. But every tier needs to be followed by a voter registration card. We have the power to do this. When we're looking at voting, whether we're looking at other civil rights laws, when we're looking at Dobbs, we keep coming back to... Weren't these things already taken care of? Wasn't this already codified by the government, by Congress? And every situation, every step we kept coming, we keep coming back to, no, it actually wasn't. No, it actually wasn't. No, it actually wasn't. And here we are again. And if we don't get it right in 2024, November, because we have a pretty good roster of potential candidates coming down the pike in 2028, so we need to hold the line right now. And when people are out there talking about, this is one thing that bothers me, Roland, Every Supreme Court decision that comes out that people see giving Trump a win or something coming down in a case in Florida with Judge Cannon and the like, we need to stop getting angry and we need to use that as more motivation to get out and vote. What these courts are telling us is that do not depend on us. If you want to save whatever 
flawed democracy it is that we have, you have to go to the ballot box. And unfortunately, so many of us are seeing these judgments happen, and they're just throwing their hands up and saying, oh, Trump wins again. See, you, you, the rich don't have to worry about it. They're above the law. And we have to do the exact opposite, because just like you talked about 2028 going into 2032 on the light, you know, I have children ages 9 to 17, and the prospect of them having to live under this particular Supreme Court or who might come after that if Trump gets in the office, it's, it's, it scares me. And so if we don't get it now, and we say this every election, Roland, right, th th this one is the most consequential, but, like, this one actually is, because, you know, we need to vote, like, in this election, like it's the last election, because it very well could be if we lose. L let me be... Very clear here, uh, Julian, and I need people watching to understand. I've never in my life identified as a Democrat. I didn't. I've never in my life identified as a Republican. When I voted in Texas, I had to pick which primary to vote in. So, I, if there was a, if there was a local, if there was a candidate that I supported, I did. I remember one year I voted in the Republican primary because there was a, there was a, a county judge in Tarrant County who was a brother who was a solid brother who was in a Republican uh, county, and I wanted to make sure that he stayed on the bench. So I voted in the primary. I remember when in Dallas County, where Dallas is, the county flipped from blue to red. And I remember uh, Judge Cruzo, he was a longtime Democrat. He had to run as a Republican to get reelected. When the county flipped back blue, he ran as district attorney in Dallas County and was elected. Why am I describing all of that? It's because that's playing chess. That's looking at the board and understanding, okay, how do we play this? And so, when I look at policies, not people, I look at policies. When I look at HBCU funding, when I look at housing, when I look at Republicans, uh, how Republicans um, wanted, didn't, wanted to cut the $80 billion that was allocated to hire new IRS agents, and uh, the story that uh, Rolling Stone did shows that, that, that thousands of rich Americans from 2017 to 2021 just didn't even file taxes. Just didn't even file taxes. They're like, yeah, we ain't got to. And now that the IRS has that money, they now are pulling in billions of dollars. Now, I'm looking at who fought the IRS agents? Republicans. Who fought for the money? Democrats. If I'm looking at who is understanding climate change, Republicans fight against it. Democrats fight for it. If I look at who fights ballot drop boxes, Republicans are against them, Democrats are for them. If I look at who supports voter ID, who supports closing voting locations, who passed laws so you couldn't hand out water while people are in line, Republicans voted for those bills. Democrats opposed them. So I, as somebody who looks at policy, can sit here and go, huh, I want to make sure that these crazy, rabid, MAGA Republicans are not in power. And so, if you have Democrats who are not perfect, who do not get a 100% score rating on everything, but if, when it comes down to those two, who is likely going to side with I stand in black people, it's going to be Democrats. So I'm now sitting here going, if it means having progressive black and black female federal judges, I need Democrats to control the Senate and the White House. And do the math. 930 federal judges. 
Trump appointed about 237 or 242. A hundred of them should have been Obama. Biden and Harris has appointed, I believe, 150 to 165. Do the math. If Democrats win in 2024, they will appoint likely another 200 federal judges. Now you're up to 360. If Democrats win in 2028, they will appoint likely another 200 judges. Now you're at 560. That means that Democrats will have appointed half of all federal judges. That is playing chess and not just looking at today. You know, Roland, I, I, I always crack up when you say people accuse you of shilling for Democrats because I think nothing is further from the truth. You're critical of, frankly, everybody. Um, but you're, you're critical from a principled policy perspective, not from a partisan perspective. And so these accusations, like you said, if people don't read, they're not thinking, um, and, and yeah, let's just leave it at that. I don't want to go low, uh, but I will if I have to. What we need to understand, as you say, it's, it's not just chess and checkers, it's pure arithmetic. Um, Merrick Garland was denied a Supreme Court position on this okie doke rule that Mitch McConnell made up and said, you don't appoint judges in the last uh, year of a presidency, BS, and then they fast-tracked little Amy Comey Barrett uh, in the last couple months of uh, the Trump presidency. So, you know, these folks, as Ely said, they don't believe in rules unless they're making them or breaking them. They don't believe in fairness. And Democrats have the unlikely um, maladjustment of believing in fairness. I'll never forget being interviewed once with Armstrong Williams, of all people, after the 2016 election. And he admitted to some of the shenanigans that Republicans have pulled to favor Trump. And there was a third woman on this panel, and she said, well, don't you care? Uh, it's not fair. She says, he said, I don't care as long as I win. Mm. And that's basically what their mantra is. As long as they win, they don't care whether it's fair. They don't care whether it's right. They just want to win. They will swallow their sense of fairness, they will swallow their pride. When I mean, you look at, I'm just waiting for a little Nikki Haley to start um, licking Trump's boots. Um, I hope she doesn't. She showed enormous spunk. But what we've seen is person after person after person. Chris Christie, um, you call the roll. Ron DeSantis, call the man everything but a child of God until he's folded and he said, oh, I endorse the orange man. So basically, we want to play principles. They want to play unfair. And only after the fact do we say anything. Hillary was so right about the Supreme Court. But you know, there's so many people who did not care, didn't think the court made that much of it, didn't like Hillary. Tell people that she's not coming to your house. Don't worry about it. Um, you know, we basically are not being strategic. And it is very late in the game. It's March. We've got another seven, eight months before the election. Uh, it's March. And, you know, people are still sitting here dithering about whether Biden is too old. Um, they're dithering about, you know, the border. The Gaza thing is very important. But do you really think that the orange man will do better with the Middle East than Biden will? Do you really think that he'll do better with the border than Biden will? Democrats are flawed. People are flawed. Parties are flawed. But what, what we know, and I've voted, well, I don't think I've ever voted for a Republican, actually, to tell you the truth. Um, it's just my hand just kind of locks up or something. But um, I voted for independence. You know, I voted, you know, off ballot. Um, in local elections, Oh, I still haven't voted for a Republican. But by and large, we have to look at issues and not at, at parties. We look at issues and go down the list, as you just did, with HBCU money, with what's happening with poverty. What's happening with poverty? Child tax credit blocked. All kind of things blocked by MAGA Republicans and their acolytes, who know better. That's the worst part about it. Know better, but won't do better. Mitt Romney. Decent enough guy, couldn't vote for him. But he, rather than fight the orange man, he says he's not going to run for another term. We so many see so many so called principled Republicans throw their hands up and say, Oh, I don't want to fight like that. Well, how do you want to fight? How do you want to go down? How do you want to go out? Because what we're going out basically destroying our country. 
So let me, uh, so uh, I saw this earlier today. Actually, I'm going to do this here. I'm going to take a break. Uh, we're going to come back uh, and pick this conversation up. Uh, folks, you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Support us in what we do. Uh, folks, ain't nobody else having this, this real conversation. Ain't not MSNBC, not Morning Joe, not Nicole Wallace, not none of them. Uh, and so support us in what we do. Join our Bring the Funk fan club. Your dollars allows us to be able to fund this show, fund the other shows of the network, to be able to do the work that we're involved in. Send your check-in money order to the P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 200-37-0196. Cash App, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, or Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollinsmartin.com. Rolling at rollinmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. For the last 15, or maybe 16 years, 18 years, I'll say, since I, when I moved to L.A., I hadn't had a break. I hadn't had a vacation. Probably a week vacation here or there. Right. This year... After I got finished doing Queen Sugar and we wrapped it up, because I knew I had two TV shows coming on at the same time, mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to take a little break. So I've been on break for the first time, and I can afford it now. Praise right. God. You know what I'm saying? Right. right. So I can afford it. And I'm like, I can right. sit back and ain't got nothing to worry about, man. But this was the first time in almost in, in two decades wow. that I've actually had time to sit back wow. and, and, and smell the roses. <laughs> the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, I'm sure you've heard that saying that the only thing guaranteed is death and taxes. The truth is that the wealthy get wealthier by understanding tax strategy. And that's exactly the conversation that we're going to have on the next Get Wealthy, where you're going to learn wealth hacks that help you turn your wages into wealth. Taxes is one of the largest expenses you ever have. You really got to know how to manage that thing and get that under control so that you can build wealth. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Hello, I'm Jamia Pugh. I am from Coatesville, Pennsylvania, just an hour right outside of Philadelphia. My name is Jasmine Pugh. I'm also from Coatesville, Pennsylvania. You are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Stay right here. All right, folks, uh, Mark Cuban, uh, of course, longtime owner of the Dallas Mavericks, uh, gave this quote here to Bloomberg for an article. Actually, I love it. Uh, he said, uh, come on, he said, uh, Mark Cuban backs Biden. If they were having his last wake and it was him versus Trump and he was being given last rights, I would still vote for Joe Biden. He ain't lying. I'm, I'm, I'm with him 100%. Uh, on that, there is no way in hell, under any circumstance, uh, that I would support vote uh, for Donald Trump. But, but th this is what I need our people to understand what happens when you sit your behind at home. This here is the Brennan Center. This is their breakdown in 2020. And what you will see in 2020, uh, when it came to voting in 2020, um, what we saw was that a significant number, uh, we, we saw a drop. Now, now, remember, if we go back to 2008, 2012, we actually made history when the black voter participation was higher than that of white voters. That was because of Obama. What happens in 20? Go to my iPad. Here's what it is right here, okay? T 2020 election. 70.9% of white voters cast ballots. 58.4% 58 of non-white voters cast ballots. That means, it shows here, 62%, 62.6% of black people voted, 53.7% of Latino voters voted, 59.7% of Asian Americans voters cast ballots. Now remember, in Texas, 2022, even with Beto O'Rourke running for governor against Greg Abbott, even after Uvalde, even after the Dobbs decision, 
even after all of the heinous thing Republicans did there, upwards of 80% of all voters under the age of 30 did not vote. And so when y'all hear me make the argument that black people, because we only make up 14%, 13, 14% of the country, we can ill afford to be at 62.6%. If you run the numbers in many places, if black people voted at 70 to 75% of our capacity, that would make the difference between winning and losing. Let me repeat that. If white voters stay here and Latino voters are here and Asian voters are here, but if black voters are here, that means more of us will be voting in elections at a higher rate than white Americans. So that means if there's an additional 5, 10, 15, 20, 25,000 black people voting, guess what? That's the margin of victory in Georgia. That's the margin of victory for Biden-Harris in Arizona. That's the margin of victory in Nevada. Then, if you talk about, again, maximizing your numbers, if we increase our turnout in Michigan, and let's say Muslim voters drop, Biden-Harris wins Michigan by 100,000 votes in 2020, they still win. Keep in mind, in 2016, Donald Trump won Wisconsin by 10,000 votes. If black people in Milwaukee increase our numbers, we still win. What happens when we don't? Well, this is what happened in 2022. There was a 50,000 vote drop off in Milwaukee, not Wisconsin, solely in Milwaukee, there was a 50,000 vote drop-off in Milwaukee from 2018 to 2022. Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, black man, was running against MAGA Republican Ron Johnson. The same Ron Johnson who tried to participate in overthrowing the election. Mandela Barnes loses to Ron Johnson by 26,000 votes. That means if there is not a 50,000 vote drop off in Milwaukee alone, Mandela Barnes is the United States Senator for the next six years. Instead, MAGA Republican Ron Johnson got reelected. This, Renita, is what I keep talking about, how we have to stop, step back and go, wait a minute, I don't need to wait for the Democrats to ho come holler at me. We've got to have black organizations on the ground driving our voting because black people in Wisconsin ain't getting nothing from Ron Johnson, and because a U.S. senator's vote is not just about his state, Ron Johnson's MAGA Republican vote impacts black people on all public policy matters, and it would be a different vote if Mandela Barnes was there and not Ron Johnson. Well, everything you're saying is correct when, as it relates to turnout is how you win elections. But the part that I feel like is not coming, that you're not quite uh, putting focus on, that what really needs to have focus on is that that turnout only comes if voters feel like that they have something to vote for and if they are satisfied with what they are seeing as far as what is being promised and if they believe that, that candidate is going to do it. This is not solely a black people voting problem because white people do the same thing. And I say that because what the left is going through right now is the same thing that the right went through a couple of years ago. We all watched it happen. The Republicans used to run candidates like Mitt Romney. When Trump showed up on the scene, 
he was able to activate an entirely new voting base of white people who previously were sitting at home and were not voting. Millions of white people who were not voting because they did not see themselves reflected in the candidates that were on the ballot. When the Republicans saw how successful it was to move forward with Trumpism, they all turned into a bunch of Trumps. And now you don't see them running candidates like Mitt Romney. And it's probably one of the reasons why he is retiring because it's getting harder and harder to stay. To stay. So I bring that all up to say, just like the right had to learn, you got to have candidates who are reflecting the base of your party and your coalition and proving every day that you are serious about doing the things that you have been elected to do and you can't have inconsistencies when people are able to check your record, the left has got to learn that as well. And I think that we are right in the process of that happening. But, I guarantee but, but, you, if Republicans ever went back to running candidates like Mitt Romney, they would lose too. So this is not solely a black problem of black people not voting. Right, You're right in the turnout, but we are spending too much time. It's important to make people understand who Trump is. People know that. But we're spending too much time framing this up as a voters making a choice between Trump and Biden. They're not. They are making the choice between voting and not voting. That is the choice. So but, but, but here's the... But, 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 on Congo, th but this is the point I'm making. I don't... I ain't dealing with white people. I ain't <laughs> dealing with Latinos. I'm not dealing with... Like no, 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 no. Follow me here. Follow me here. I'm not... I'm not, I got... I don't have white folks in my equation, Latinos or Asians. What I have in my equation or what, as we as black people care about. So when I'm talking about turnout, I'm also talking about black candidates. I'm talking about how they're going to vote. I'm talking about understanding and looking at power. When I look at, and again, I know what they're saying privately. I, Chris Christie, Rudy Giuliani, all of them, they couldn't stand Trump. Um, Congo. Yep. They knew he was the idiot, but they understood power. And what I am arguing is, not, and, I, and what I'm speaking about ain't just Biden Trump. Sherry Beasley loses by 401 votes as the chief justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court. Had Sherry Beasley won, Democrats would have a six to one majority on the state Supreme Court. Why does that matter? Because by them controlling the state Supreme Court, they get to stop the madness of the Republicans in the legislature. And so, if we look at, again, our voting power, I'm looking at what can we stop. I'm not interested in complaining after the fact. It's black people right now in Louisiana who are complaining about Governor Jeff Landry. But guess what? Look at the numbers of turnout. And so turnout means that I am voting not just for person or for party. Yes, I'm voting against evil because of what it may do, and I'll give you an example. President Obama, Obama, Obama Congo, wins North Carolina by 14,000 100 votes in 2008. The Obama coalition stayed home in 2010. North Carolina used to have one of the lowest voter participations. It was at 78% in 2008. What did they do? They stayed home in 2010. Republicans took over the legislature, began to pass voter suppression laws. Here we sit some 16 years later, and in North Carolina, they are still trying to claw back to where they were in 2008. I'm saying we got to be thinking multi-year, multiple battles here, and not stay at home. Oh, Macongo, go ahead. Well, I, absolutely. I think one of the challenges, you know, we, we definitely have to talk about, you know, you know, appeals of, of, of the candidates and the like, but Republicans fall in line while Democrats wait to fall in love. And I think too often Democrats have this mindset of, you know, I don't really love the candidates, so I'm not really going to mess with them. And, they, and they're, they're not thinking strategically enough. And so even if Mandela Barnes wasn't somebody who people felt was, you know, a charismatic enough candidate or wasn't really going to represent their issues, the courts are an issue. 
Voting rights is an issue. Look where we are with Dobbs now and, and other areas like that. Those are issues that we could have had principled enough people on in the Senate or, you know, who, who we could have had, you know, to get to the Supreme Court and other areas if, you know, Hillary came into office, who could have prevented some of the major challenges that we're dealing with right now. And furthermore, when you talk about the Brennan Center report, they talk about that, what they're calling, you know, that that, that voting gap, you know, that racial voting gap. And they're talking about since uh, Shelby V. Holder, you know, came into place in 2013, right, you know, the, the, the disparity between white and black voters has started to grow in ways that that have been worse since before Obama came into office. And so, again, that's also a court's decision. And so too many times in our community, we find ourselves confronted with things that if we develop a certain level of uh, sophistication enough, we could understand that if we tackled these things in the past, we wouldn't have to deal with them now. Like what you talk about in Milwaukee, where 50,000 people just don't show up, or you talk about 2010 in North Carolina, these are issues that are leading towards real problems now. And so on some levels, given everything we've had to deal with the courts just in the last two years alone, we have to develop a certain level, like Hillary talked about, we have to be a kind of single-minded voter as it relates to what's coming forward in 2024. We can talk about, you know, Palestine and, and issues relating to Biden's policies there. We can talk about issues relating to health care and other things. But who is going to be in power to create a court system that's going to affect our agenda for generations? Period, um, bottom line. And that's where Republicans have always been. And I and I appreciate what Renita's saying in terms of, you know, what, what the Republicans went through and how they switched their candidates and all of that type of stuff. I understand what she's saying. And we need to go through that a little bit as well. But when we're dealing with this existential threat to our very well-being in this country, there's a certain level of, uh, and I'm not saying compromise principles, but there's a certain level of strategic mindset that we need to have and who we're going to put in office period, bottom line. And so we got to increase the numbers if we really want to take part in this American experiment. Uh, Julian, um, again, I'll use an example. I was there on the ground for the special election in Mississippi where Mike Espy lost to Sen Senator Cindy Highsmith by 65,000 votes. And there were a significant number of black people in Mississippi who were eligible but did not vote. And not just them. There were a lot of Poor white people, eligible, but did not vote. But I'm going to take them off the table. If I only focus on black people who did not vote, that number, had those folks voted, had 65% of the black people in Mississippi who did not vote voted, Mike Espy is a United States senator. That changes the game in Mississippi. So, so for me, I, I'm not sitting here, I, I'm not having a conversation of what white folks are doing. What I'm saying is when I look at the numbers and when I look at how we change black participation, black registration, black turnout, if everybody else stays the same, we can win elections across the board. Well, Roland, you've made the point before, and it's useful for us to re examine that point again, about the racism in the Democratic Party and the extent to which many of the Democratic operatives do not pay attention to the black electorate. While everybody has a responsibility to get out and vote, if you look at a Mississippi and a Mike Espy case as an example, who are the operatives? Who was doing GOTV? Who was going door to door? Who's, who was basically telling people that people should not be told you have to vote? But we know where we are. And so it seems to me that all too often the Democratic Party does not pay attention to their base, which is African-American people. They do not spend money on African-American operatives, on GOTV, on polling, and all of that. Sherry Beasley could have won easily had she done a few very minor tweaks. But she had the white boys from the Democratic Party telling it's her seven how to but, work but, in North Carolina. But that's why, but Julian, that's why I'm arguing that if you're black, send your money to groups like Black Voters Matter who are going to be on the ground. What I'm arguing is, and again, holding these strategies accountable, but what I'm saying is we've got to also be funding our own institutions who are doing the work. 
Well, I don't disagree with you about that at all. I think that folks like Latasha, Melanie, these other folks, they're doing the work. And we can't rely on the Democratic Party. And in the very short run, I'm with you. I don't give a you-know-what about the Democratic Party. I give a whole lot about black folks and our power and our rights. But right. in the medium right. run, in the medium run, though, we must hold the Democratic Party accountable because the fact is that they take us for granted. And we need to stop that. And if it takes us, I don't want to set out an election because look what happens when we do. But we have to hold that party accountable and we have to hold them accountable in the harshest of terms. And, and, and what I'm saying is I'm not having a party conversation. I'm having a black conversation. And here's the final point before I uh, go to a break. Go to my iPad. Uh, I, I told you, folks, this was the headline in Texas where it says 75% of Texas voters under age 30 skip the midterm elections. 75%. Now, here's what was interesting. So, this progressive advocacy group, Gen Z for Change, says both parties in the state failed to mobilize and engage young voters in the way that they should have been. And I'm going to say it again. If you're waiting for a party to show up, you're doing the wrong thing. Your interests matter. Your interests matter. And so, if we're talking about 2024, if we're talking about November 2024, I need people to understand that in order for to make a difference in 2024, you have to actually care. And if you're in Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, Arizona, Nevada, those are likely going to be the states that determine who wins the presidency. But I'm also talking about U.S. Senate, Congress, governors, state reps, state senators, judges, DAs, all down the line. We have to understand that our power is literally in our hands if we decide to use it. And if you choose not to vote for whatever reason, shut the hell up. When we come back, we'll talk to the candidates running for the 18th Congressional District in Houston, including incumbent Sheila Jackson Lee. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. You heard why we're marching, and, and it's really a launch. It's not even a march. We're launching That's right. a 42-week campaign March the 2nd at 10 o'clock in Raleigh and 33 other state capitals right. and the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a historic move to mobilize mm -hmm. the most powerful untapped block of voters in this country, right. poor and low wealth voters, who make up 87 million votes. And it's never been tried before. Never been tried before in history. At the same time, the same message, same focus. And when that power turns loose, yes. they will not be able to figure out the political calculus. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to shake things up. I'm ready to get up out of the valley. I'm ready for God to put his spirit on us. I'm ready to be used to change this nation. And what we're saying is, can't we come together? Can't we come together around an agenda? You ain't got to like everything about Reverend Barber. You don't have to like everything about Sangria. You don't have to like everything about Long Choir. But can we come together and say, it's time to end poverty as the fourth leading cause of death? It's time to have $15 at a living wage indexed with inflation. So every time inflation goes up, the minimum wage goes up. It's time to have health care for all. It's time to fully fund public education. Can't we come together? It's time to protect women's right to women's health. It's time, it's time to have affordable housing for everybody. It's time to stop the proliferation of guns. Ain't no way folk ought to be able to have more guns than they have food, more guns than they have meat on their table. That makes no sense. Isn't it time for division to be ended and love to take over? Can't we organize around that? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor? everything about you. But can't we organize for power? Can't we stand for justice? Can't we love everybody for just a little while? Can't we come out of the valley? Can these bones live?
Mitchell, a news anchor at Fox 5 DC. Hey, what's up? It's Sammy Roman, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Folks, primaries are taking place all around the country, Democrats and Republicans running. And when you look at most of these uh, elections for Congress and most incumbents, uh, they are running unopposed. But that is not the case in the 18th Congressional District uh, in Houston. Longtime incumbent uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, uh, she is running for re-election, but she's also uh, facing uh, a challenge uh, from former Houston City Councilwoman uh, Amanda Edwards. Those two are battling off in Texas. They go to the polls uh, tomorrow. Uh, challenger Amanda Edwards joins us right now. Uh, you were initially running for mayor of, uh, uh, of Houston, and then Congresswoman Jackson Lee got in the race, and then you dropped out, announced that you were running for Congress. She lost by 30 points to State Senator John Whitmire. He's a new mayor. She's not running for her old seat. So the question is, uh, what are your plans what, what do you want to bring to the 18th Congressional District? Because uh, you want them to choose you, not the incumbent. What will you do for the district? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And I think when I go around the district, uh, what has been resoundingly clear is that people are ready for change. And they're not just looking for everyday change. They're looking for transformative solutions to some of these lingering challenges that they have faced year after year, whether it's access to health care, economic opportunity, if you're talking about housing, Many of the issues that are really kind of meat and potatoes issues, people looking are looking for transformative change, which they can get through policy solutions. I think separate from that, in addition to being able to respond to the existing challenges, people are looking to have a leader who has a vision for the future of this community. So bringing bold solutions to the table and a bold vision that includes everybody in it having the opportunity not just to get by in the community, we want them to thrive in the community and having a pathway for success for each and every single resident is part of that vision. But I'll ask again, what specifically, again, if you're doing a contrast between you and the incumbent, what will you bring to the district that she won't? Well, one of the things that I think is imp important to note is that a lot of the change that we're looking for, the transformative change that we're looking for, really requires systems change, uh, policy fixes. And it's not been something that has been the emphasis or focus of the Congresswoman in the past 30 years. We have seen quite a bit of constituent response and advocacy, and certainly you've got to do that too. But I think there is another realm of this role that really requires us to really get serious about systems change. When you look at how infrastructure dollars works in a city like ours that had the second worst disaster in U.S. history, and the fact of the matter, we've set up systems that have failed our people. And so I want to implement systems change through policy. But, 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 but i got to ask you, though, when you say that, because we understand how it works. And so if you're getting congressional dollars, typically they're coming back to states and community development block grant funds. Uh, and then that's going to the Republicans uh, in Austin. We saw what happened with hurricane uh, money that came to the state, uh, and Harris County got screwed out of a billion dollars. And so you can be a member of Congress and fight for those federal funds, but if the money is going to Republicans in the state, they get to control how, it's how, it, how it is dispersed. And so how, as one member of Congress, and if you get elected, you're going to be a backbencher. How do you actually create that change? So you, you've highlighted exactly what I'm talking about. That system is flawed. It doesn't work. And so having and redesigning a system that doesn't send the money to GLO, you don't have to send the money to GLO. We can legislate something different, a different system in the first place. Why introduce a, a the politics of Texas into a space like uh, what's needed on the ground in Houston as it relates to infrastructure investment? I'll back up. 
Why do we even have to sit here every time there's a disaster in this country, every year that there's a disaster, there's a new, a new law that has to get passed, new rules that have to get promulgated. Meanwhile, you've got residents who need answers immediately that you cannot provide because we've designed a system that doesn't make sense. So we've got well, to go that's... back to the drawing board and not just accept the existing status quo as what well, has to be just because it's always been because it hasn't worked for our residents. Well, well... So when you do legislate, we can do plug, plug and play where you have an evergreen set of policy in place where it's plug and play for the jurisdiction that might be most impacted at that particular time. Well, well obviously, again, just from a disaster standpoint, uh, you don't know what to allocate until a disaster happens. So are you suggesting that there should be uh, a national disaster fund of $100 billion that depend upon what disasters happen in the country that's drawn from versus Congress voting on each disaster? Yeah, I, I, we can look at ways to do that through a fund. I mean, this is something that we sadly uh, can predict it will happen. And it happens all over our country, um, all, all over the coasts that experience certain types of weather and other natural catastrophes. And so we've got to look at ways that we can actually make these systems work. It makes no sense to have to wait six to 12 months to know what the policies will be in your community as to whether they're going to buy out your house, whether or not that there's going to be a policy in place that helps you elevate your home, things like that. It, it, it doesn't make sense. And so we've got to go back to the drawing board, whether it's through a fund or whether it's through some other mechanism in Congress, the existing system doesn't work. So we've got to explore new and innovative approaches to really addressing the needs on the ground. Uh, last question uh, for you, um, and, and that is, if you get to name your top two priorities for the district, if elected, what are they? Health care and economic opportunity. I say health care. When I was growing up, my father was very ill with something called multiple myeloma. And it sh he passed from it when I was a teenager. But it shed light to the fact that our U.S. health care system is very broken. And I remember asking my father whether his life-saving treatments would be covered by this insurance stuff we were learning about, I was learning about. And, and of course, his response to me was, well, we just have to figure something else out. And for so many Americans, they are in the middle of that type of conundrum where their lives are hanging in the balance of whether their insurance will cover their life-saving treatments. And in this case, I think we've got to bolster, enhance, improve the Affordable Care Act. I don't think we were ever, it was ever designed or intended for us to stay where we currently are. I think it was always designed or intended that we would improve and expand. Uh, but for political reasons, that has become a little more challenging. But separate from that, economic opportunity, it's starting from education all the way to how we support our entrepreneurs. One of the things that I hear about most is the disparities uh, that some of our, our entrepreneurs of color face when they're trying to access capital, scale their businesses. So in addition to the support that we see with the SBA, one of the things that we could be doing is, and we learned this lesson during the pandemic, instead of just, you know, when they were trying to issue PPP loans out and they went through the traditional banking institutions, we saw Shake Shack get 10 million and then mom and pop shops had to close their door, those on Main Street. And so what they did was wise up and say, hey, well, how do we better connect the resources to the types of mom and pop shops Main Street businesses that need these resources most, and that came that came by way of connecting with CDFIs or Community Development Financial. Well, well, actually, actually, truthfully, that actually happened after the 2020 election uh, when Biden Harris uh, got in. Democrats uh, then controlled uh, the House and the Senate, and then they worked through that. We were we were involved in that with the National Bankers Association uh, and CDFIs, and so. Uh, that actually happened when, again, uh, th th when they actually took over. Right. And I, what my, my point to you was just simply that this should be the model forward.
Um, when we think about how how few people actually even know what CDFIs are, let alone how to access that, that can be a gateway yep. to creating more equity in our community. So I think the lesson was learned on the first tranche, and they made the adjustment on the second. And I think that should be a pathway forward so that we can start seeing equity um, and equitable outcomes in our small businesses of color. So I, I, don't, I applaud those efforts. All right. Amanda Edwards, we really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Folks, go on to a break. We come back. We'll be talking with incumbent Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Democracy in the United States is under siege. On this list of bad actors, it's easy to point out the Donald Trumps, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, or even the United States Supreme Court as the primary villains. But as David Pepper, author, scholar, and former politician himself says, there's another factor that trumps them all and resides much closer to many of our homes. His book is Laboratories of Autocracy, a wake-up call from behind the lines. So these state houses get hijacked by the far right, then they gerrymander, they suppress the opposition, and that allows them to legislate in a way that doesn't reflect the people of that state. David Pepper joins us on the next Black Table, here on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please, support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. On the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, what does it mean to actually have balance in your life? Why is it important and how do you get there? A masterclass on the art of balance. It could change your life. Find the harmony of your life. And so what beat can you maintain at a good pace? What cadence can keep you running that marathon? Because we know we're going to have, you know, high levels. We're going to have low levels. But where can you find that flow, that harmonious pace? That's all next on A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. And you know what you're watching, Roland Martin Unfiltered. Don't believe the BS. Black people ain't down with Donald Trump. A Florida conservative radio host says he and his team are responsible for the AI-generated images of Donald Trump posing with black voters. Uh, they've been posted on social media. The images were created by Mark Kay, one of a dozen discovered by BBC Panorama. These fake images of black Trump supporters generated by artificial intelligence are one of the emerging disinformation trends ahead of November's presidential election. Uh, it, this goes to show you on the Congo, they, they cannot attract black people, and so they got to create fat, fake, fake black people. Uh, and if you look at one of the photos, uh, one of them has too many fingers in it. <laughs> wow, well, I, I, I did not peep the fingers. I did not peep the fingers. And, you know, this is really problematic. And, 
it kind of goes off of what happened in New Hampshire, you know, with that fake uh, Biden robocall. And, you know, law enforcement, Justice Department, local officials, they really need to crack down on this. The one of the Joe Biden robocall was like a random magician who made it in like five minutes or so. You know, there needs to be penalties for this. You know, these individuals are coming forward basically saying like, yeah, I did this, but they're creating propaganda and they're lying. And I'll be honest, kind of going back to our last segment, I feel like there are too many folks out there who have some type of prominence, whether it's in the celebrity space or even influence in their local community who will use something like this and they'll say, hey, does Biden ever come to the hood? Does he ever come and, you know, sit down with us? You know, Trump's for the people and so on and so forth. And people will be susceptible to that. I've seen some of these interviews where people are talking favorably and lying about things that Trump has done, whether it's HBCUs and the like. And this is just part of that as well. And of course, the lies about the COVID, you know, related checks and the things like that. And so we need to call these people out who are doing this once they're found out. So I'm glad that you're doing this here. There needs to be fines because this is another form of election interference. And, you know, three, we need to remind folks about what's actually being done in the black community and for black people by the Biden administration. Again, we can criticize people as they need to be, like you do all of the time, Roland, but we also need to call out the good when it's actually done. Because even if these pictures were real, Roland, the real question becomes after that. What's he actually doing for you in your hood? What did he actually do for you in your hood yep. when he was president? And that's a real conversation, a real evidence that can highlight what he has not done for our community. And let's be real clear. Trump did not send out uh, those PPP loans. Uh, Democrats in the House actually passed that and in the right. Senate. So he just slapped his name on it. Now, uh, remember uh, when Trump made these comments uh, at that conservative gathering? It was actually a black conservative event attended by mostly white people. Charles Barkley wasn't having none of it. And you know who embraced it more than anybody else? The black population. It's incredible. You see black people walking around with my mugshot. You know, they do shirts. Please. When you heard that, what did you think? <sighs> Big sigh. First Big of all, sigh. I'm just going to say this. If I see a black person walking around with Trump mugs, I'm gonna punch him in the face. Charles. I uh, know, Gil. Charles. Gil. Gil. Gil you, I, you really can't say that because a, you don't mean that. You, oh, I mean that sincerely. <laughs> I'm gonna just tell you something. And then you will be arrested for assault. And then what? I'm gonna bail myself what? out and go celebrate. <laughs> if I no, don't encourage him, don't encourage him. Okay, but it, go ahead. Seriously. Continue. <laughs> First of all, if I was at that. At that conference, yeah. I'd have got up and walked out. That was an insult to all black people. Because mm -hmm. he's basically just saying, and first of all, black, to, to compare black history where we've been discriminated against to his plight. Yes. Well, first of all, he's a billionaire. Mm -hmm. And they're prosecuting him for stuff he did wrong. They're prosecuting <laughs> him for stuff he did wrong. And for him to it's compare... It's still in the court system, Charles. We have to wait. It's still in the court system. But continue, continue. Well, continue. They, some of the stuff is true. They did storm the Capitol. Well, well, yeah. They did say that the, the election was stolen. Those yeah. aren't lies, Gail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are They facts. did say that. They okay. did say that. But to compare, I would have got up and walked out. Mm -hmm. Because it's not a fair comparison. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a billionaire. He's had a great life. He's been president of the United States. To insult black people who have been discriminated against all these years, to put them in the same category, I, I, I was just offended. I, yeah. I mean... Okay, um, Julian, I, I, I like Gail, but did Gail forget who she was talking to? And if you go to my <laughs> iPad, well, she's like, Charles, you really don't mean it. Charles Barkley threw a dude through a glass window because he kept bugging him. <laughs> Charles... <laughs> Charles Barkley is not joking. Let's be real clear. He threw a dude through a glass window, and his quote, you said, if you bother me, I'm going to whip your ass. <laughs> Julia, go ahead. I'm just laughing. Um, I'm with Charles. I don't want to see any of those folks with, um, you know, with those mug shots on their, on their chest. Not that I'm going to threaten to whip them, because I'm a little old lady. I don't get to do that anymore. But uh, much. Anymore. But the bottom line here is that Trump has pandered to the lowest of stereotypes. Um, we like him because he was indicted. He said uh, Friday, I was indicted for y'all. That's what he said. I was indicted for you. Now, any black person in their right mind who supports that nonsense is not in their right mind. 
the, the, but he 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 just he panders to the lowest common denominator, and he's really not talking to black people. He's talking to white people who think the same thing about black people. He's really talking to his base of MAGA conservatives, but he's using black folks as a smokescreen. Well, the fact is that we allow that. Now, all those people who are in those pictures are AI-generated. They can prove that it's them. They ought to sue because their likenesses were misused. I know that AI is a whole area that I'm not going to touch because I don't fully understand it, but you know, we do know that you can manipulate images, you can manipulate voices, and they've done quite a bit of this. But back to the orange man. What you know, I, I I really need somebody, Roland, to break this down in terms of we keep hearing these numbers. Eighteen percent of black men say they're gonna vote for the orange man. I don't believe that data, and I have not seen that data. Well, well, well they I, say I, that actually the latest New York Times Siena poll, uh, they actually say twenty plus percent of all black voters are gonna vote for Trump. A lot of people have broken those polls down uh, and they've gone through that. Uh, but uh, look, well, Terrence Woodbury broke Terrence Woodbury broke down the 2020 uh, uh, election where he said how Trump did with black men played a role in Tom Tillis, who was a senator, who's a MAGA senator, uh, picking up about 16 to 18 uh, percent of uh, black male vote, and that played a role in him winning. So at the end of the day, it depends upon the state, uh, because again, uh, and so it's two things. It's, and also, if you have low turnout, Obviously, those who do, do turn out, they're voting for Trump, has a greater impact because low turnout actually amplifies them. Go ahead. But here, here's the bottom line, though. I mean, whatever the numbers are, a poll is a moment in time. A poll is not election day or the pre-election time, early voting, when people are looking at this. I'm hoping that my brothers, that African-American men, will look at what that man has done for them, which is zero, 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 and pandered to the lowest common denominator. And I just don't see, it, it's very troubling to me that brothers, and I, you know, I think I've talked about this before, my own sibling, male sibling, voted for Trump in 20. No, in 16, but he didn't in 20, because he said the man wasn't about anything. Well, it took you that long to figure that out when you have four sisters. But in any case, he claims that it's partly because of economic empowerment partly because of his machismo, um, that that attract black men to him. I want brothers to prove him a liar. I want brothers to stand up for values. He hasn't done anything for black people and won't. In fact, he'll continue to vilify, to lie, um, and thinks that inviting Kanye to his to Mar-a-Lago or putting out a new sneaker line is going to endear him to black people. It will not. I'm with Charles Barkley. Well, uh, look, at, at the end of the day, um, um, uh, Renita, look, there are, and I've seen, I've seen it, and I've seen the comments, whatever, there are black women out there who are talking about voting for Donald Trump. There are black men, okay? It's there. But, but the bottom line is, I think part of the problem, what I'm seeing with these national conversations, and this is where I blame every executive at MSNBC, at CNN, at ABC, at CBS, at Fox News, and all of these, all these networks, they are having poll-driven conversations and not policy conversations. They were having conversations about Biden's age and, oh, he made this mistake, but they were not talking about Trump slurring his words and stuff like that. To me, that's still all the superficial stuff. The question comes down to, what are your policies? What did Trump do? What did Biden do? What is Trump saying he's going to do? Trump is on record, national abortion ban. They're on record of having a Christian fundamentalist um, administration. And so mainstream media is stuck on polls and stuff like that and not actual policy and the impact on people. Well, and the one thing that you have to keep in mind with polls, as you said before, it is true. Some black people are going to vote for Trump. And I, as somebody who has had to campaign to voters, you will never hear me condescend to voters about how they should decide their vote and, um, and, and tell them, you know, what they should or should not be doing, because I just don't... That's what helps us uh, as Democrats lose elections. Those who do vote for Democrats, progressives, and everyone on the left, that's exactly how you lose elections. But I will say, as, as far as the polls are concerned, 
it, one thing that is probably not commonly known, unless you have worked um, as, as unless, you, unless you have been a candidate or unless you have worked at a campaign, a lot of people don't realize, but the polls really do not, um, they don't do the, a significant or a good job of polling the number of black people that they need to in order to extrapolate the results. And so for years, no matter what issue you talk about, no matter what issue you think about, whenever they show polling, um, it typically does not reflect what is the on the ground opinion for black folks. But that's and not always, the goal. <laughs> But that's not the, the goal. The, 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 okay, the goal, what, what I'm seeing right now, the problem that I'm seeing right now is that the conversation is completely about polls and not policy. And so I don't care what the poll is. What you now have is Cornell Belcher, who is a Democratic pollster, he's talked about this here. He said when all of the conversation is about polls, then it's Drop, that's constantly being bombarded in people's minds. And so all they're talking about, okay, polling this, polling that, as opposed to what they are talking about. That's why on this show, you, you rarely see me bring up any of these polls. Because I don't care what the polls say, we're trying to give people information about policy and not a poll. Right, but the other point I'll make, because I'm just trying to put in perspective for you what these polls really mean. Oh, no, no, man, I know what they mean, but I'm just saying, I got to go ahead. Hold on, let me finish. It's also connected to what we were talking about earlier about these AI images. What they are, what Trump is trying to do, and these polls kind of play into it, is make more black people feel like there is, you know, voting for Trump is not something that is so far um, out of the realm of anything legitimate. Voting for Trump is something that more black people are starting to get on trend with. That's what they're trying to make folks feel. And so, like, when you look at the AI pictures that Trump is doing, I think the difference between this and that is that when he previously was campaigning, he had blacks for Trump, those folks standing behind him. And when people started to investigate... They were frauds, the black too. Right, I was gonna say, right, let me finish. You had the one guy, when you looked into it, he was actually a five-star documentary where he was uh, allegedly a part of a cult. I mean, he was a significant a part of a cult, probably the most prominent um, Blacks for Trump person. So with these, a with these AI images, what they're trying to do is say, okay, if you don't see yourself reflected in the normal Black for Trump folks that you see at rallies, look at these pictures of Black people who look like you do, who look like your everyday neighbor or look like your, who would probably be your friend. Look, they are accepting of Trump. And so I think between the polls and between the AI pictures, what they're trying to do is run a campaign that basically is saying it's not that extreme or it's right. not that weird for black people to be into Trump. So that's why I think it's and, important and to have that perspective for people to understand how polls are constructed and how they are derived. Well, and people again, know, and, and again, vote. at the end of the day, uh, the whole point is to have conversations not about policy, uh, but about that. Over the weekend, I was going back and forth with some of these crazy uh, MAGA folks, these anti-immigration black people. Uh, and this dude, Mark Carter, out of, out of Chicago, I guess, uh, he actually made this comment here. Go to my iPad. Uh, he is so anti-immigration. He said, all of America, including the KKK, should join forces to put a stop to you and all other immigrants from invading America. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the black people out there uh, who uh, is dancing for Trump. Yep. Wow. Yep. Just understand, he literally is touting, oh, yeah, the KKK, too. Um, enough said. Enough said. Uh, all right, y'all. Um, yesterday in Selma, Vice President Kamala Harris uh, was there for the 59th uh, anniversary of a Bloody Sunday. Uh, and here is what she said to those in attendance. The fight for freedom. That every person in our nation has a right to be free from the horror of gun violence. And yet today... These extremists stand by and refuse to pass reasonable gun safety laws to keep our children and places of worship safe. Freedom. That every person in our nation has a right to be free to love who they love openly and with pride. And yet, just this past year, extremists have passed or proposed hundreds of laws targeting LGBTQ people. Freedom that every person in our nation has the freedom to learn and acknowledge our country's true and full history. And yet today, 
extremists passed book bans, book bans in this year of our Lord 2024. Well, they also try to erase, overlook, and rewrite the ugly parts of our past. Fundamental freedoms under assault. The freedom to vote, the freedom from fear, violence, and harm, the freedom to learn, the freedom to control one's own body, and the freedom to just simply be. And understand the profound impact these attacks have on the next generation of our leaders. Just last fall, 15,000 young leaders joined me during my fight for our Freedoms College tour. And for them, these attacks on freedom are a lived experience. It is their lived experience that extremist leaders have intentionally closed polling places near college campuses and restricted the use of student IDs to vote. That it is black voters and student voters who are most targeted by anti-voter laws. A lived experience that during the height of their reproductive years, the highest court in our land, the court of Thurgood, an RBG took a constitutional right that had been recognized from the people of America, from the women of America, so that now this generation has fewer rights than their mothers and grandmothers. She also spoke about the ceasefire proposal it's on the table between Israel and Hamas. What we are seeing every day in Gaza is devastating. We have seen reports of families eating leaves or animal feed, women giving birth to malnourished babies with little or no medical care, and children dying from malnutrition and dehydration. As I have said many times, too many innocent Palestinians have been killed. And just a few days ago, we saw hungry, desperate people approach aid trucks, simply trying to secure food for their families after weeks of nearly no aid reaching northern Gaza. And they were met with gunfire and chaos. Our hearts break for the victims of that horrific tragedy and for all the innocent people in Gaza who are suffering from what is clearly a humanitarian catastrophe. People in Gaza are starving. The conditions are inhumane. And our common humanity compels us to act. As President Joe Biden said on Friday, the United States is committed to urgently get more life-saving assistance to innocent Palestinians in need. Yesterday, the Department of Defense carried out its first airdrop of humanitarian assistance, and the United States will continue these airdrops. And we will work on a new route by sea to deliver aid. And the Israeli government must do more to significantly increase the flow of aid. No excuses. They must open new border crossings. They must not impose any unnecessary restrictions on the delivery of aid. They must ensure humanitarian personnel, sites, and convoys are not targeted. And they must work to restore basic services and promote order in Gaza so more food, water, and fuel can reach those in need. As I have said repeatedly since October 7, Israel has a right to defend itself. And President Joe Biden and I are unwavering in our commitment 
to Israel's security. Hamas cannot control Gaza, and the threat Hamas poses to the people of Israel must be eliminated. Hamas is a brutal terrorist organization that has vowed to repeat October 7th again and again until Israel is annihilated. Hamas has shown no regard for innocent life, including for the people of Gaza, who have suffered under its rule for almost two decades. And Hamas still holds dozens of hostages for nearly 150 days now. Innocent men and women, including American citizens who were brutally taken from their homes and from a concert. I will repeat, the threat of Hamas poses to the people of Israel must be eliminated. And given the immense scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire. Yeah. For at least the next six weeks, which is what is currently on the table. This will get the hostages out and get a significant amount of aid in. This would allow us to build something more enduring to ensure Israel is secure and to respect the right of the Palestinian people to dignity, freedom, and self-determination. Yeah. Hamas claims it wants a ceasefire. Well, there is a deal on the table. And as we have said, Hamas needs to agree to that deal. Let's get a ceasefire. Let's reunite the hostages with their families. And let's provide immediate relief to the people of Gaza. On Congo, the position that the vice president took, this is not a new one uh, internally. She had been pushing the president since November on this, uh, on this uh, very issue to even uh, publicly state the call for a ceasefire. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like people have unfairly criticized her and saying that she hasn't done enough. I mean, she's the vice president. She's not the president. You know, they've gone after the fact that, you know, she has a Jewish husband, all, all of these different things that were just unfair. And so, you know, I, when she was making that speech, you know, we can tell like the audience was kind of like, eh, I don't know if this is the spot. But as soon as she went to that ceasefire part, you know, people were with her because that's what we want. And I do believe that even though they try to downplay what happened in Michigan, you know, last week, uh, this is not something that became all of a sudden something they wanted to do because of what happened in Michigan. Because like you said, she's been pushing for it for, for a while behind closed doors. But the fact of the matter is we're getting closer to the election. And when you have 100,000 people who decide to vote that they're not committed, they had to make an, an immediate step to show that they're committed to doing something different. We see that a member of the Israeli government is coming, you know, Gantz, who's coming later this week, who's going to be meeting with Harris, who's one of Netanyahu's enemies, and, you know, Netanyahu's upset because he's afraid that there might be a type of pivot. And look, I think that it's going to go so far that uh, Biden's going to end up calling for Netanyahu's resignation publicly. And I feel like they need to go hard. There are some people that they've already lost because of what has happened. They are not coming back. But I feel like there are some people who can be swayed to come back to the Biden camp and some people who aren't sure they wanted to see where this is going to go who are going to be pleased by this and so many people feel it's way too late but you're there you're honoring somebody like a john lewis and a dr king and the like dr king said the time is always right to do right and that's what vice, pre Re vice president harris did and what she said right rita well, I'm really glad to see the vice president really separate herself um, more publicly. Um, as you stated, this is not the first time that she has said this, but I'm glad to see her continue to re reiterate where she stands because it can become very easy to say, OK, well, whatever the president says is what the everyone in the administration believes. And I know from being an elected official, you always want to speak for yourself and you don't want um, voters in the public assuming that you stand with somebody who may have been your uh, running mate. So I'm glad to see her just perfectly you know, articulate exactly how she feels on this issue. And it is important because, as uh, Omicongo mentioned, what we saw in mission, 100,000 voters voting uncommitted, 
that uh, campaign is moving across the country. I'm seeing things here online in Georgia where folks are saying, um, you know, we don't actually have that here in Georgia, the uncommitted option, but um, people are talking about skipping the uh, presidential election in the primary, which is the same thing as making the statement of being uncommitted. So that is something that is moving across the country. And so I really, you know, I commend, you know, her making herself clear because people are, many people, right. she's making herself clear why many people are complaining about how Biden is talking about Gaza while eating ice cream in a very cavalier uh, sort of way. Julian. I applaud the vice president for her statement, and I'm glad that she called for the ceasefire. She's done it before. This is a very public place to do it, and that's why she got the applause. It's over time for this. Uh, Netanyahu is trying to stay out of jail, just like somebody else we know. And that's why he's allowing this conflict to go on. There are over 100 people still being held as hostage. But Hamas is basically uh, playing hardball because they want, they want aid. And people are starving. Children are starving. Uh, the numbers of people who are starving is just immense. So she was right to call that out. And uh, good, good for her. I think the more she speaks out, the more people can see that she is of presidential timber. Um, and because you've got, what's her name, um, Nikki Haley running around acting as if Biden can't make it past his first, uh, you know, first few weeks of his term. But like Mark Cuban said, I vote for, Bi I vote for Biden, you know, on his deathbed rather than vote for Trump alive and well. Um, gotcha. Yep. All right. Hold tight one second. When we come back, we're going to talk with Congressman, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, uh, who is seeking another two year term in Congress. Also, Emmett Smith goes after the University of Florida over the issue of DEI. Will the athletes follow suit? And so glad to see my man Sinbad, after suffering a debilitating stroke, actually appear in public for the first time. We will show you him speaking as well. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Support us in what we do. Join our Bring the Fuck fan club. Send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zayo, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back. You heard why we're marching, and, and it's really a launch. It's not even a march. We're launching That's right. a 42-week campaign march, the second at 10 o'clock in Raleigh and 33 other state capitals right. and the District of Columbia. This is, a, this is a historic move to mobilize mm -hmm. the most powerful untapped block of voters in this country. Poor and low wealth voters who make up 87 million votes. And it's never been tried before. Never been tried before in history. At the same time, the same message, same focus. And when that power turns loose, yes. they will not be able to figure out the political calculus. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to shake things up. I'm ready to get up out of the valley. I'm ready for God to put his spirit on us. I'm ready to be used to change this nation. And what we're saying is, can't we come together? Can't we come together around an agenda? You ain't got to like everything about Rem Barber. You don't have to like everything about St. Greer. You don't have to like everything about Long Choir. But can we come together and say, it's time to end poverty as the fourth leading cause of death? It's time to have $15 and a living wage indexed with inflation. So every time inflation goes up, the minimum wage goes up. It's time to have health care for all. It's time to fully fund public education. Can't we come together? It's time to protect women's right to women's health. It's time, it's time to have affordable housing for everybody. It's time to stop the proliferation of guns. Ain't no way folk ought to be able to have more guns than they have food, more guns than they have meat on their table. That makes no sense. Isn't it time for division to be ended and love to take over? Can't we organize around that? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't need to like everything about you. But can't we organize for power? Can't we stand for justice? Can't we love everybody for just a little while? Can't we come out?
Farquhar, executive producer of Proud Family. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Election Day in Texas tomorrow. Earlier we talked with Amanda Edwards, who is challenging Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee uh, for to represent the 18th Congressional District in Houston, which Congresswoman Lee has represented for the last uh, 29 years. Representative Lee joins us right now. I'm glad to have you back on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Uh, what are your priorities for the 18th Congressional District if you are reelected? Well, Roland, thank you for having me, and thank you to all of your viewers. I know they are the kind of people that understand activism and service. And what I intend to do is what I've done in the past, which is to give the highest level and quality of service and fix the problems that my constituents have had, and I have been a fixer of problems. But as my agenda proceeds uh, for the next term, it will be to build more housing. Everywhere I go, I hear uh, the needs of housing in neighborhoods restoring our neighborhoods, listening to the neighbors about the quality of housing that they need so that those who've been priced out of the market can come back. I want to make sure that I create a greater access to wealth for our businesses and those young families and others who are making their first steps in creating businesses um, for the first time. I want to make sure that health care is preserved, expanded Medicaid and Medicare. I've been a champion uh, for a universal health care, a champion for originally the Affordable Care Act, but also the public health component, I sat at the table and argued and advocated for the most expansive health care that we could get, protecting for our seniors, Social Security, uh, and then, of course, going back to the table for all of those families who have suffered to introduce and reintroduce the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. I am the lead as a ranking member on the Crime Subcommittee. We are planning on moving forward to ensure that we can do two things at once, respect law enforcement, but have justice. And that has been the work that I have been able to do. I am known for leading and passing the Violence Against Women Act, making it one of the strongest laws that we've ever had to not only protect women, but provide the resources for law enforcement to be able to cure those issues. When I say cure, solve those issues of domestic violence, sexual assault, and provide women with protection and men as well. And then to make sure that uh, we deal with AI in our community, particularly the impact on African Americans and labor, to make sure that labor is strong. And then one of the things that I'm certainly proud of, to continue to grow the history of our people, as I led and was the first, uh, the author of the Juneteenth federal legislation, created the federal holiday, the only sitting member in Congress that has created a federal holiday, the first one in 38 years, then I want to make sure that we move forward on the commission to study slavery uh, and develop the response uh, to those years. I am not afraid of moving on issues that challenge us, but I'm also not afraid of representing the entirety of my district, which is Latinos, Anglos, African Americans, Asians. I am there to be the problem solver. That's what I hope to do in the next term. You talked about housing as one of the critical issues, but the reality is uh, there's an underbuilding in this country from 2010 to 2000. Uh, in 2020 and 2020 to present day, uh, we are not building homes fast enough. It's the lowest number since the 1940s. How do you, as a member of Congress, do anything about the, la the, the underbuilding? What do you do to change that? I am a good collaborator. I'm also a person that comes home to the district and does not sit down. I meet people all over, and I have met just a large component of new and young builders who are eager to get into the marketplace and to do the job. So my first task is to collaborate, bring those young builders together, bring them together as a group, and begin to formulate uh, an engine and an energy of home building, giving them access to credit, meeting, bringing the bankers here, uh, talking to the private uh, equity community. I've talked to uh, some of them, and they're excited about being in the housing building market. Put them with these young and new builders. Multiply the number of people who are building in neighborhoods. Let the neighbors tell them what kind of housing uh, type you want to have so that it fits the neighborhood and the neighborhood's quality and culture is not lost. I believe that you can do things when you think creatively, just like I did with the $50 million first-time grant to Texas Southern University pursuant to the Inflation Reduction Act, working with Dr. Robert Bullard, uh, the father of environmental justice. Uh, we can do things that have never been done before. And since building, housing, 
is a commitment, a passion. I want to get those many, many builders that are individually operating, let them work together, and let us begin to move with federal partnership funds from HUD, private equity funds, and then access to the uh, capital markets through our banks, through the CDFIs, and really build for our people and for our neighborhoods, no matter what neighborhood you live in. So I see the solution to the problem, and I want to be part of the effort to bring back housing to our neighborhoods. And every time I say that, there's a smile on the faces of those constituents that I'm meeting with. Uh, your opponent says she wants to change systems and how things work, uh, such as money that comes back to the state. I said, well, the money comes back through the community development block grant funds, and oftentimes that goes to the, to the governor to the, of Texas uh, and doesn't necessarily come back to the cities. Uh, uh, speak to that, because that's what I've heard from black mayors as well. Uh, they say, hey, don't send the money to these red state governors. Get the money directly to uh, mayors of these cities, a lot of them who are African-American or who uh, are Democrat or who are nonpartisan. Your thoughts? Well, first of all, that has been an issue that myself and the Congressional Black Caucus and the Progressive Democrats have been working on. Uh, it's an issue that I know about, that I understand. First of all, in disasters, there's something called the Stafford Act. One single member that's a freshman will make no headway in any change of any system. Uh, what has to happen is a massive overhaul of the legislation uh, and advocacy, and you have to do the work. And I've been able to successfully bring direct funding to our cities and our counties uh, as a million dollars that came in for our victims' assistance, uh, dollars that have come in to build uh, economic empowerment centers, dollars that have come in for housing. It's the members' hard work. But as it relates to the law, we have all been working on looking at how we uh, rewrite the law that has not been able to be rewritten in probably 50 years or more to be able to uh, sidestep uh, that direct uh, routing of funds that is the policy of the federal government to the states, which then ultimately goes uh, to local government systems. But what you have to do is be astute as a member who has seniority, who is a chief deputy whip, as I am, uh, who is someone who is uh, able to collaborate with the chairman of the Appropriations Committee to build a foundation of getting direct funds to the cities that you represent, uh, like the city of Humble, like the city of uh, Jacinto City, like Houston, all of those places I've represented, and I've been able to get direct funding to them. It is the knowledge, it is the experience, uh, it is the uh, can do working with other members of Congress of equal seniority uh, and understanding and wanting to help Sheila Jackson Lee in her particular district. We want to make system changes, but that takes a very long time, and the Stafford Act has not been changed in decades. Uh, so we don't want to give up, but we want to find alternatives to put money in the pockets of our great mayors. And I believe in collaborating with our mayors. I've collaborated with every single mayor uh, that I have had the privilege of representing, including bringing enormous dollars to them during disasters. Hurricane Ike, Hurricane Rita, Hurricane Katrina, which uh, it did not directly hit us, but the people who came, we had to provide resources for them. And of course, Hurricane Harvey, I provided and led on the effort of $155 billion to be brought back in order to help the people here and get extra money to help small businesses restore themselves. I initiated that effort under Hurricane Harvey. Um, you're, you're 74, your opponent is 43. You've been there 29 years, and you have critics who say, okay, you know what, we're tired of folks being in Congress that long. Uh, we need younger, fresh voices, fresh perspective. Your response to that? Well, I love the opportunity to be given to people uh, to accept roles of responsibility. Um, I may be that in age, but my temperament, my energy level, uh, is at any competitive level that you might of any age. Uh, what I would simply say is it's about doing the work. It's service. It's a passion for being committed to getting the job done. I'm still getting the job done. There's more work to be done. That work is not finished. And I will open the door and opportunities, as I've done over the years, for many, many people who've gone on to elective office, gone on to positions in uh, presidential administrations, been leaders in campaigns across the nation, been locally elected officials, and I intend to continue to do that. And yes, uh, life does not give you, um, everyone, a guaranteed 100 years. And so as I do the work, 
there will be opportunities to be able to share the opportunities of leadership. Uh, I give that all the time, and I look forward to doing that with the many individuals who are interested in serving in the United States Congress. But I'm really grateful to them for respecting me and my work and deciding uh, that they will collaborate with me. One of the candidates, uh, Robert Slater, who is a contemporary of the uh, present uh, candidate still in the race, dropped out of the race to support me and to speak about being able to be at the table with me, which is absolutely the truth. And we are committed to certain issues. I know he would not mind saying he spent 10 years incarcerated. He's got ideas. I am looking forward uh, to being able to work with his ideas, work with those in his generational outreach. My reach is from five years old to Gen Z, Gen X, millenniums, uh, families, and our elders. We learn from all of us. And I've been a congresswoman that has been fortunate enough to work with every single level and to bring joy and response on their needs. So I'm going to continue to do that and continue to be someone who mentors, open the doors of opportunities, and the doors will be open and there will be opportunities for many people to walk through the door. You can count on Sheila Jackson Lee being that kind of member of Congress. I've done that in the past and I enjoy it in the future. And Roland, as I walk through this district, I am seeing people hugging me about all the things that I've had a chance to do for them. And they are of the contemporary age of the uh, individual who is running. And they are contemporaries of uh, people who are not my age. And they are clearly seeing me as lively, ready to serve. I have people fighting for me because they saw me fighting for them. And that's all I can offer as we go into the election tomorrow for Sheila Jackson Lee to reelect me because you know that I've been fighting for you. And so I hope that you'll fight for me and that together we'll make things even better. There has been a continuous progress in the 18th Congressional District since I've been elected. There's not been one year when there's not been a progressive change or movement or growth or funding since I've served. I've not let one year languish, uh, if you will, or be without attention uh, because I've been there at this number of years or I'm going to be there this number of years. Right. I've never taken this seat for granted, never. Congressman Sheila Jackson Lee, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It's a good to be with you. Folks, election Bye -bye. day. Get out and vote. Gotcha. Election day is tomorrow, folks, in Texas and several other states across the country. And, of course, we'll be talking about those results tomorrow, but also on Wednesday's show. All right, when we come back, I got to talk about uh, Emmett Smith blasting University of Florida over them firing all of their DEI staffers. Isn't it time for these black football players to say peace to go into these state institutions that don't want black folks there? We're going to break it down on our panel next on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Switching sides. Grow your business or career with Grow with Google's wide range of online courses, digital training, and tools. Gain in-demand job skills with flexible online training programs designed to put you on the fast track to jobs in high growth fields. No experience is necessary. Learn at your own pace. Complete the online certificate program on your own terms. Stand out to employers, get on a path to in-demand jobs, and connect with top employers who are currently hiring. Take one professional career certificate program, or all six. Earn a Google career certificate to prepare for a job in a high-growth field like data analytics, project management, UX design, cybersecurity, and more. All professional career certificate programs must be completed by December 31, 2024. Scan the QR code to complete the application. There are 1,000 scholarships available. Grow with Google and J. Hood and Associates. Be job ready and qualify for in-demand jobs. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. It's an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to
start to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Barnes and on the next frequency, Professor Janelle Hobson joins us to talk about hip hop and its intersection with feminism and racial equality, plus her enlightening work with Ms. Magazine and how the great Harriet Tugman connects with women in hip hop. So it was not hard for me to go from Harriet Tubman to hip hop, honestly, because it is a legacy of uh, black women's resistance and black women supporting our community. That's what Harriet Tubman did. That's on the frequency on the Black Star Network. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from LA, and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. On a next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, what does it mean to actually have balance in your life? Why is it important and how do you get there? A masterclass on the art of balance. It could change your life. Find the harmony of your life. And so what beat can you maintain at a good pace? What cadence can keep you running that marathon? Because we know we're going to have you know, high levels, we're going to have low levels, but where can you find that flow, that harmonious pace? That's all next on A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. It's John Murray, the executive producer of the new Sherry Shepard Talk Show. This is your boy, Earthquake. And you're tuned in to Roland Martin, Unfiltered. <laughs> Pro Football Hall of Famer Emmitt Smith, uh, the NFL's leading rusher for his career, uh, dropped the bombshell blasting his uh, alma mater for firing all of their DEI employees. Now, remember, the state of Florida banned DEI across all state institutions, uh, and Emmitt Smith was not having any of it. He dropped this statement right here. Uh, Emmitt said, quote, come on, guys. Come on, guys. Come on. Thank you. Um, I'm utterly disgusted by UF's decision and the precedent that it set. Without the DEI department, the job falls to the office of the provost, who already has his, their hands full, to raise money for the university and continue to advance the academic studies and athletic programs. We cannot continue to believe and trust that a team of leaders, all made up of the same background, will make the right decision when it comes to equality and diversity. History has already proven that is not the case. We need diverse thinking and backgrounds to enhance our university, and the DEI department is necessary to accomplish those goals. And instead of showing courage and leadership, we continue to fail based on systemic issues, and with this decision, UF has conformed to the political pressures of today's time. To the many minority athletes at UF, please be aware and vocal about this decision by the university who is now closing the doors on other minorities without any oversight. And to those who think it's not your problem and stay on the sidelines and say nothing, you are complicit in supporting systemic issues. Now, 
uh, a lot of people about there, obviously, especially your MAGA right-wing folks have been critical of Emmett Smith, but he's getting a lot of support, uh, and he's right on the money. And the reason why this is important, folks, is because when you have athletes, former athletes, uh, legends, icons, dare to stand up and to challenge conventional thinking, then you're going to see, I believe, uh, a fundamental difference. Now, some of y'all may disagree with me and say, well, I don't really know if that's the case. Huh, do y'all remember uh, when a brother out of Mississippi State uh, dared to say, I'm not playing for, uh, under that Confederate flag? And then what happened? Uh, they quickly moved. Remember this story right here? Uh, this brother, give me one second. Let me pull it up here, unlock it, there we go. All right, remember this story right here? Mississippi State running back. I won't represent this state until flag is changed. And when uh, Kylan Hill made that particular uh, uh, comment, he of course was one of the top rushers uh, in the NFL, excuse me, in college football. Folks, it did not take long for, uh, uh, for them to change the state flag. Literally, the white races in Mississippi, Republicans, have been fighting for a long time to keep that Confederate emblem on that state flag. When that brother and other athletes started saying, we ain't having it, and when those white head coaches started telling those lawmakers, the black players not coming to our state, they immediately changed that flag. Y'all might remember University of Missouri, when they also uh, announced they were gonna boycott over issues. That led, to the, that led to top university officials resigning and massive changes at the university. This is what we know. There is power from athletes. A few months ago, when Texas A&M, uh, well, they screwed over Kathleen McElroy, an uh, A&M uh, uh, graduate. I called on athletes, four and five star athletes, to tell Texas A&M, peace, if you can't uh, hire black folks after they graduate, then I'm not coming to your university. And I called on a bunch of former athletes to stand up. Many of them were silent. And so, in, if we're talking about changing here, right now in Alabama, the mayor of Birmingham, Randall Woodfin, came out and said, if Alabama gets with a DEI in the state, black players should not come play football at Alabama or Auburn. And I'm telling y'all right now, college football cannot exist without black players. Ask uh, Bear Bryant what happened when Alabama had his all-white team and USC came to town with all them black players and kicked Alabama's ass up and down the field. Them white races in Alabama said, we're going to have to go get us some of them, and that's when they were able to go out and recruit black ball players. So I know some people are also saying, well, man, you know what? Uh, the owners uh, shouldn't be on these players. Y'all, understand something right here? America don't understand nothing but money. And you might remember, at black athletes during a slavery, they were seen as money, major earners. They still are major earners for Texas, for Texas A&M, for Florida, for Florida State, for Alabama, for Auburn, for Ole Miss and Mississippi State, and for Tennessee and on. If we are going to see changes in our society, it's gonna take more than civil rights activists, more than black-owned media, more than other advocates doing what's right. And I guarantee y'all, if football players and basketball players say, nah, we ain't coming, all of these states will change those laws quickly. You know why? Because if you're not playing for a national championship in football or basketball, and you're not getting any of that TV money and that playoff money and donations drop, oh, they gonna buckle. And so I really hope in the aftermath of this that Emmett Smith is not standing alone. I hope more University of Florida Gators stand with Emmett. And I hope this spreads. I'm not sure, though, that folks have the intestinal fortitude to stand up and demand that kind of change. Rita, your thoughts? 
Well, I actually uh, graduated from the University of Florida, so this is my alma mater. And I can tell you that when I saw his statement, I was nothing short of elated to see that he had said that. I think what he is saying is so important. Um, I was elated because it just reinforces again over and over what we continue to see, which is black people are really good at coming up. We as a community are really great at coming up with strategies, strategies to respond to white supremacy. I think it's very important that this message is coming from Emmett Smith because um, it's coming that is it's important that it's coming from him because if athletes are thinking to themselves, okay, well, I don't know if I want to do this because this is such a great sacrifice. He knows what he's asking you to do. So the messenger matters. And so from, as you mentioned before, with Mayor Ruffin and now Emmett, this is a excellent strategy. It absolutely will have effect, particularly on Florida and at the University of Florida, because I remember when I attended, the entire school, most of it revolved around what happened with the uh, football team. And so I'm elated to see this. And like you said, I hope that he does not stand alone. I hope that this really takes off across the country. And, and, and here's the thing, I'm a Congo, and I need every parent of an athlete to understand this. What these schools are saying is, we want your black talent. Mm -hmm. but we don't want you when you graduate. Mm -hmm. That's what Texas A&M did to Kathleen McElroy. Oh, how dare she go work for the New York Times? How dare she advocate for diversity in the industry? And they made it clear, we're not going to hire her. There were, cons there were white conservatives on the Texas A&M Board of Regents who were behind this effort. And they had to pay a million dollar settlement. So basically what those white conservative Republican Regents were saying is, oh, Roland Martin, oh, sure, you in three halls of fame. Just found out today, I'm about to get inducted to a fourth Hall of Fame, but you ain't welcome to come back and work at the university because you believe in diversity. This is where we need, and here's the thing, all you need, Amakongo, are one, two, or three athletes to say, I'm not coming to your school because of your attacks on DEI by your legislature. And I'm telling you, it will, it will send uh, a shiver down the spines of every coach and every assistant coach and every recruiter because they're going to be wondering, oh, my God, who's next? And, all, and, and, and if you're a four or five star, be recruited by Florida, you likely will be recruited by Ohio State and Michigan mm -hmm. and USC. So there are numerous top programs you can go to. I hope we have some black parents and some black athletes who have the courage to say, you know what, I'm with Emmett. And if they commit it to Florida, decommit and say, it's, this is why, trust me, they will all of a sudden change. Oh, absolutely. And the space is, is right for this. I can completely see somebody like, a, you know, LeBron James, you know, the guys like Seth Curry coming out in support of these types of players, you know, because of so many of these these uh, players are activist minded. Uh, we saw what happened with the NBA and the Clippers and what they did to get rid of that president. But here's the thing in Florida, we got to also understand that a lot of these owners in different places, they're more emboldened. The Orlando Magic made a donation to Ron DeSantis in the name of the organization, which includes the players. And so my my point is that as we're going towards this election, these or these owners and presidents and stuff, they're getting more emboldened. And so we have to become more emboldened as well. And so when we're talking about what happened in Missouri, what we're talking, and then you've got to remember, a lot of these players now, they can get their NIL deals. You know, they have lots of ways to make money and, and wield their influence. And so these Students, they have to, in addition to the DEI, I work in this DEI space, so I see these cuts and disrespect happening to our stories every single day. But in addition to the DEI space conversation, Roland, these players have, you know, some of them are, are women, right? You know, in terms of the, you know, the women's sports. Then, you know, some of these male players, they got mothers, they got <laughs> sisters, you know, people who are being affected by these abortion issues and other things. So in some of these states, there are so many issues that these players can choose to take a stance on, starting with this DEI. And as Dr., as, as sorry, as the late Johnny Cochran said, hit people in the pocketbooks and their hearts and minds will follow. Uh, and, and, and understand something here, Julian. Go to my uh, uh, iPad. In 1969, there were nine black football players at Syracuse University who stood up. Uh, and they're actually, they're called 
the, the, it was a book that was called the Leveling, the Leveling the Playing Field, the story of the Syracuse Eight. Not only did they boycott practice, they boycotted the 1969 season. Now, they paid a price when that happened. They kicked them off the team, and the university did not recognize their achievements until some 20, 30 years later. But the point I'm making here is I'm not even saying black players say we're going to boycott. What I'm saying is if black recruits, two, three, or four, say, oh, I was going to go to Florida, but since y'all did that, no. I'm going to go to this school. Well, I'm going to go to this school. It will freak these folks out, and they will change. Absolutely. You know, the thing is that um, they're used to us having our hands out. They're used to us being grateful, happy to be there. But what we're finding is as the pendulum shifts, people are not necessarily happy to be there. They don't want to go to a school that doesn't recognize diversity. They don't want to go to a school that does not respect their history. They don't want to go to a state that has banned 1,600 books. And so you're right. If two or three or four say, we're not coming there, we'd rather go to Ohio, Michigan, any place else, they will pay attention. And if one of those players goes to, let's say, Michigan, and Michigan beats the stuffing out of the University of Florida, you know that that coach is likely to be fired, likely to be in some kind of trouble. How did you let him get away? Well, I didn't let him get away. Y'all let him get away with your policies. So chickens are coming home to roost, and it's reckoning time. Well, and again, what I am saying to these black athletes and what I'm saying to their parents, these schools, they want your labor. These schools want you running up and down the field. And let me, let me put it to how I put it with Texas A&M. They believe in DEI on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> they believe in DEI when it comes to Saturday afternoon. And if we are going to change a system, it hits them where it hurts. And with black labor, withdraws its labor, and they are denied black talent. When they no longer have us running up and down the field, running a 4-4 and a 4-5 as running backs, quarterbacks, DBs, and linebackers, oh, trust me, when they begin to see that we have the guts to stand up for our people and say, we don't have to play for you, we can go elsewhere, they will absolutely buckle because mm -hmm. America understands money. And I keep telling y'all, if you ain't having a money conversation, you're not having an American conversation. And black athletes represent billions, billions to college football, to these states, to these TV networks. Show them your power. Stand with Emmett Smith. Let's see it happen. Renita, I'm a Congo. Julian, I appreciate y'all being on today's show. Thank you so very much. Folks, be sure to support us in what we do. Uh, look, we built something here other folks not doing. And that is, we're covering the news of the day in a way that nobody else is doing. We're fighting these battles every single day. And when I say we're fighting them, we're fighting them. I don't know if y'all saw my Instagram page. I would love for y'all to go comment on my Instagram page. Uh, but you saw today me ask the question on Instagram, on Twitter, on Fanbase. State Farm, how much money are you spending with Black-owned media? You saw me ask the question, Pfizer, you're spending billions of dollars a year on advertising. Why so little with Black-owned media? You saw me say, Merck, you had a black CEO. How is it that y'all are spending so little on black-owned media? You heard me, you saw me call out uh, several others as well. Uh, let me see, I'm pull them up. I want to show their logos, y'all. Uh, let's see here. Let me pull them up. AstraZeneca, same thing, another pharmaceutical, spending crazy amounts of money on, on, on advertising. I see their commercials and advertisement and billboards all over the place. But again, where's the money for black-owned media? AbbVie, another pharmaceutical that spends crazy amounts of money. 
Guess what? Black-owned media seeing little of that money. And Bristol Myers Squibb, hold on one second. Bristol Myers Squibb, same thing, spending lots of money on advertising, commercials on ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, MSNBC, virtually non-existent on black-owned media. Folks, the only way this game changes is when we demand a return on our investment. But in the meantime, your support is critical. So when you give to our Brina Funk fan club, it allows for us to be able to do what we do. Right now, y'all, look, this is how transparent I am. And I'll tell you right now, right now, we need to fill two positions. Those two positions are gonna cost us about $110,000. Let me say it again. And we actually need to fill three positions. So if, we, if, we, if we're able to raise $160,000, we can fill those three staff positions that gives us greater capacity to do what we do. Want your donations? I can't do it. I'm going after these folks. I'm blasting these folks. I'm challenging these folks. In fact, that was another, uh, we got an email, uh, and that was this um, uh, big meeting they had last week. Uh, and it was called uh, the Growth Fronts. And it was a part of the ANA. And you see it was called Diverse Zone and Targeted Media Participants. Now here's the problem. I, along with Urban Edge Networks, Byron Allen and others, we were a part of the Black Owned Media Collective. We were the ones that started this movement. We were the ones that forced General Motors and McDonald's and Target and 30 or 40 companies under Group M to commit to spending more money with black owned media. But let me tell you what they did. The companies shifted from black owned media to diverse owned media. So these folks had a big old conference last week and invited all these companies, you see, and a lot more, but didn't invite us, even though we started this movement. Oh, I've already sent them a letter, an email, and posted them on social media saying, how you not go invite the people who started the movement to get us more money? How you, go, how you not go invite us to your growth front? Show it again. How you not go invite Black Star Network and Urban Edge Network and Agrio and others to your growth fronts when we started this movement? But you had time to invite a whole bunch of folk who didn't sign the letter. So I need y'all to understand the only way we can challenge these folks is if we own our own media. You can't do this if we working for somebody else that's not black owned. And when we say get black owned, you know what then happens? That money then allows us to hire people. You got black folks and others who've been laid off. Buzzfeed News, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, Vice, talented people who are now out of jobs. Imagine if we were able to generate an additional two to three to four to five to ten million dollars in revenue. We can go from 15 people to 50 people to 75 people to 100 people. I already have the vision laid out. We, we would have folks, bureaus in Atlanta, New York, Chicago, Dallas, Los Angeles, reporters in Charlotte, South Florida, in Atlanta, again, all over. None of that happens without resources. So to join our Bring the Funk fan club, send your check-in money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, Dollar Sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, R Martin Unfiltered, uh, uh, Venmo is RM Unfiltered, Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com, Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Y'all have a Sinbad video? All right, uh, so support us in what we do. Last thing before I go, y'all, uh, remember, a few years ago, Sinbad suffered a debilitating stroke. Over the weekend, they had this A Different World tour, going to about 10 people, places all around the country. Well, for the first time, we got to see Sinbad, y'all, 
and it was so glad, glad so I was so happy to see this brother, uh, for us to hear from this brother. I sent him a text, been praying for him, and so he posted this on his Instagram video on page, y'all. It has been a long, hard battle back for Sinbad. Press play. Man, that was so cool. A different world going to Atlanta, going to Morehouse College on the campuses, and getting a chance to be on a Zoom and say something to the kids. It's wild that the kids even know who I am. That's beautiful. Thank you to everybody who's been praying for me and saying good things and supporting me during this time in my life. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. God has been with us and he's carried me. Well, he's carried me through my whole life. And it means so much when I hear from y'all and you tell me, Sinbad, keep going, saying, Sinbad, we're sending prayers, we're praying, my family's praying for you. Those words are important, and I feel it. I feel those prayers. I want to say this to all the people who have emailed me through the website. Some of you are going through what I'm going through, or even worse than me. I'm reading these things. I'm going to try to answer as many as I can. I pray for you. And understand what it's like. It's rough. I want to thank all of y'all who've been fans and friends all these years of mine. Thank you so much. Thank Expect you. to see more of me soon. And don't freak out if you turn around, I'm standing right behind you. Sit back, I can't believe you're here. You can't believe it. You better believe it. <coughs> Miracles happen. So for years, Sinbad has been challenging me. He's like, Roland, you gonna one day you gonna do a 15 minute set on stage. I'm like, Sinbad, that ain't what I do. He's like, no, nah, you funny. You gonna get your butt on stage. All right. So when Sinbad, when you get back on that stage, I'm gonna be on that stage with you. All right, my brother. Be praying for you. Be well, folks. I'll see y'all tomorrow. Ho! Start network is. Oh no, punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. I thank you for being the voice of Black America. Momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?